we record. Welcome to The Emerging Human, where we explore optimizing health and body spirituality and post-conventional living. I'm Michael Osterling, a therapist, coach, educator, and I'm your host. Today's show is brought to you by Somatic Psychotherapy Today. Today's guest is Sheriona Menzim Sills. Dr. Sills began teaching embodied embryology through somatic movement in 1997 as part of her doctoral studies in pre and perinatal psychology, which led her to teaching at Naropa University and the Santa Barbara Graduate Institute. She has taught and facilitated pre and perinatal psychology therapy continuum and biodynamic cranial sacral, cranial sacral therapy globally, often with her husband, biodynamics pioneer Franklin Sills. It's good to see you, Dr. Sills. It's really good to see you too, Michael. Good to meet you. <laughs> Very good to meet you as well. And I, I definitely appreciate your book. And let me plug both real quickly, <laughs> Spirit in the Form, which is one of the ones we're going to be talking about. But also, I would like to recommend also folks check out your other book, mm -hmm. The Breath of Life. And you have such a unique pathway. And what you've studied is so unique in our culture. And I love before we kind of jump into what is pre and psychology and why it's so important for us as a culture to embed it in our culture and institutions. I'd love to hear more about your path and what you what led you to be who you are today. Mm, yeah. Well, thank you. Um, and yeah, I think about it and I go, well, really, as a pre and perinatal therapist, I have to go back to the very beginning, you know, my conception. <laughs> I won't go into all the details of that part, but you know, I'm very aware that I did all the, the healing work and all the studying um, because of my very early beginnings that weren't so easy, you know, were, were quite traumatizing, actually. Um, so without going into all the details, <laughs> um, I feel like in response to your introduction, thank you for the introduction, um, <laughs> I feel like saying, well, I've never been very good at being normal, you know, and staying the regular cultural, culturally accepted path. So um, I started out in my work as an occupational therapist, which actually wasn't all that normal at the time either. You know, people would always say, what's that? <laughs> so I've gone on to do other things that I had to explain, but um, I, um, I had a life-changing experience a couple of years after I started working as an occupational therapist, where um, I was also a folk dance fanatic, <laughs> and my sordid past. Um, <laughs> and um, through the dangerous activity of folk dancing, I suffered a concussion. And um, it kind of, it knocked me out of my usual way of being, which was very much in my head. You know, when I look back, I think I, for at least the first 20 something years of my life, I lived from here, you know, from the neck up. And I was not very here otherwise. I was very intellectual. And um, the concussion made that difficult to continue. And I'm so grateful for that. Um, again, without going into all the details, it really spurred me on to start exploring alternative methods of healing. Maybe I'll just say that because it's kind of interesting, but I was having some issues a year after having after the accident and um, went to a neurologist and he thought I had MS, multiple sclerosis. Oh. And yeah. And I'd been working with people with MS as an occupational therapist and had thought that's one thing I would never want to get because there's no cure for it. The, and so he wanted me to go on to get a spinal tap, which is the way they, I think even now they diagnose MS through a spinal tap. But I knew that it was a very painful, invasive procedure. And I remember, you know, that experience feeling like the floor falls out from under your feet. <laughs> but I felt that when he told me. And I kind of wandered out of his office in a daze and wandered around the neighborhood. And I didn't know anything about anything at that point, but I feel like something guided me and said, don't go through with the, the spinal tap. Just think of yourself as healthy. And that was a very novel idea to me. And um, so I never went back to him. I never got diagnosed. 
And as far as I know, I don't have MS, although I wouldn't be surprised if I'd gone that way, you know, I probably would be fairly disabled by now. Um, but instead, I felt like my intuition really came in and guided me into various kinds of healing and alternative health. Let me ask about your intuition. Is, is that something you've had ever since you're a little person? Like, is this something you've been aware of, been able to utilize for your own benefit, or did it arise around that same time, or how did that show up inside you and for you? Yeah, well, I believe we all have that when we're a little person, but um, I wasn't so connected to it, I think, because of my traumatic history. Um, and I wasn't completely disconnected from it, but I was, uh, after the concussion, various things happened that it really opened up. And I think, you know, I wasn't able to think as intellectually, I couldn't depend on my usual ways of figuring things out. Mm. So, you know, it's like the right side of my brain started to be more dominant and things came to me and I listened. And that led me into these different kinds of therapies. And I tend to end up teaching and practicing whatever I experience, so. <laughs> T t tell us a little bit about some of the different therapies you explored and then eventually integrated into your own work. Well, I think the big, one of the big ones was that I, um, I, I developed some really serious allergies after the concussion. And I think my whole system was just thrown off and someone introduced me to macrobiotics, um, which most people think of as a way of eating, but it's really a way of life. And this is back in 1982. Um, <laughs> that, yeah, okay. I've, been, I've been more or less macrobiotic for a long time, okay. but it, it's very holistic. And so I, I had a consult and I, um, besides a diet, I was recommended to do some Tai Chi and some uh, acupressure. I ended up taking a course in acupressure and um, it started to open me up you know, and it got me interested in other kinds of body work. And so then I started trying different things. And I think I maybe was already doing some yoga. I can't remember. Um, but, Where were you geographically at this time in like the early 80s? I, well, I'm Canadian. Although I live in okay. the UK now, but I was in Toronto at that point. That's where I went to university. Um <clears throat> Because I could imagine like today, you know, 2021, yoga studios, Pilates studios, meditation, you know, it's kind of more normalized in large cities across the world, 82, a little less so. Um, how did you discover some of these interesting practices that you explored? Well, I'm just remembering how I discovered yoga. I mean, people today would be shocked um, unless they're as old as I am. <laughs> Nobody knew about yoga when I was in high school, you know, in the 70s. And um I remember coming across a book in a bookstore that was about yoga. I went, oh, this looks interesting. So I took it home and I taught myself yoga. Um, <laughs> and, you know, no, I'd never heard of it before. Nobody ever talked about it. Nobody was doing it. Um, however, after the concussion, I started running into these things more. And um, so I was doing that and I started learning different kinds of massage and body work. Actually, I wasn't quite there yet. I started doing some uh, more intuitive counseling work. And that started bringing me into my body. Nice. Because I found, so uh, my intuition told me to move to Vancouver, the West Coast. <laughs> and I moved there and felt at home immediately. And something shifted you know, people, I imagine most people listening to this are in America and they know about the West Coast, you know, things happen there. Yeah. And <laughs> so I started to find my work was becoming more and more physical. And I didn't know much about massage and body work at that point, but I started to find, you know, that I was doing this hands-on healing work and it was quite powerful. And I, at some point I thought I should probably find out what I'm doing here. So I started taking <laughs> massage courses and body work courses and that started really bringing me into my body and meeting my trauma, the reasons I uh, hadn't been so much in my body. And yeah. I, I was proud, sorry. No, no, please, please. 
so I, I started practicing, you know, I'd had a, a bodywork practice in Vancouver. And I started having these people just spontaneously birthing themselves off my massage table. I remember there's a story in Spirit into Form of, I think it was two, two guys, like six, six, two quite large men. And I think you, you acknowledge that you're a little shorter of a, of a lady. And it was a kind of an interesting experience for you to see them rebirth on your table. Would you mind sharing one of those two stories and how it led you to further deepen your explorations into that space? Yeah. Well, it was a long time ago, so I can't give all the details. But, yeah, um, say they were about a foot taller than me, yeah. much bigger than me. And um, at some point in during the treatment, I, I vaguely remember, it was similar for both of them, that they started kind of inching themselves forward and coming off the table from the head end, coming off. And I was just doing my best to keep them from falling off the table, you know, supporting them and birthing them onto the floor. You know, we both recognize this was the birth process. One of them actually, I think it was one of those guys, ended up, um, he wrote a little testimonial for me at the time and said that um, Sheriona is a midwife for the soul. Ooh, and I thought, I oh, that. yeah, i yeah. very touched by that. And I, I can resonate with that still. So um, these kinds of things were happening. <laughs> and around the same time, I was uh, um, one of my body work trainings had really uh, brought me more into dance. And um, I encountered five rhythms uh, dance you know, from Gabriel Roth. Yeah. And, wow. uh, so at that point, I was living in British Columbia. I was in, actually in Nelson, BC, um, okay. is a little bit inland from Vancouver, for those who don't know. Um, and there was a five rhythms teacher there. And uh, she was going down to Seattle to see Gabriel Roth and invited me to go with her. So this happened two years in a row. I went and I did a workshop with Gabriel and I loved it. And it, the first year in my head, I said, well, why aren't I doing this? You know, like I could be doing this. The only reason I'm not doing this, I'm not trained in it, but I could be doing this. And <laughs> the second year, I must have said it out loud to somebody. And the person said, well, you know, I have a friend who's studying dance therapy. And I went, dance therapy? What's that? <laughs> and so she said, yeah, she's studying at this place called Naropa. And something in me just went, ooh, I got to go there. And so I ended up going to Naropa, moving to Boulder, and studying dance movement therapy. And as part of that training, I was, I was continuing to get more and more into my body. But you can't do somatic work without encountering pre and perinatal work, pre-verbal experience. So one of, uh, one of our courses was called um, Birth and Death in Body-Centered Psychotherapy. Wow, great. Name. It was amazing. Yeah. Yeah. And I remember sitting in this course going, this is it. Oh, you're I, and, and I was quite shocked because I had never planned to go to graduate school. And here I was getting a master's degree. And what's going on in my head is I need to get a PhD in this. <laughs> and so I did. Um, <laughs> well, but let me also point out that getting a PhD in pre and parental psychology pre and perinatal psychology and health today is a challenge, let alone back then when you wanted to do so. Now, as I said to you offline, I'm hoping more and more people pursue those kind of degrees and influence the culture yeah, and institutions too. that are necessary to do so. But like you're, that's, today it's even cutting edge. Back then when you went through school, it's even more cutting edge. Can you talk about how you found a program and organize it around what you wanted to learn and yeah. some of the teachers you had? Well, as you, I hope it's okay to say this, as you demonstrate, it's hard enough to say pre and perinatal psychology, yes. <laughs> let alone to find Sorry it. That. Um, Sorry about that. So there were no programs in pre and perinatal psychology at the time. And I, I'm not sure there are any uh, degree programs available right now. They kind of come and go. But um, through my 
studies at Naropa, I had met William Emerson, and who's a pioneer in the field of pre and perinatal psychology. And um, he, he actually became, my, my master's thesis was looking at pre and perinatal uh, themes and authentic movement, which is a kind of movement work. I studied with Tina Stromstrid. Uh, oh, great. Day. Yeah, yeah. Maybe. Yeah. Lucky you. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, I was. <laughs> so I, I started teaching that at the time also. Um, but um, William, I had asked William to be an advisor, and he said he would only do it if I uh, talked to Jean Rhodes. And Jean Rhodes is, uh, she's been very involved with APA, the Association for Pre and Perinatal Psychology and Health. And she was actually living outside of Boulder, which was convenient. And um, she had done, I, I don't know if she was finished yet, but she was the first person to get a, a PhD in pre and perinatal psychology. And she did it through the Union Institute, which is now called the Union Institute and University, I think. Um, and she had looked at I think for her master's thesis, she looked at um, some pre, pre, I think it was prenatal aspects of yoga. Um, so William thought I had to meet her because she was doing the closest thing to what I wanted to do, which was looking at different kinds of uh, pre and perinatal uh, movement patterns and how they were showing up in authentic movement. Um, so, to make a long story a little bit shorter, <laughs> I ended up designing my PhD after Jean's. Uh, she, she advised me on my, in my PhD. And so she was doing it through the union. So I went to the union and the union is a, it's a, an alternative, but accredited school where you create your own PhD. And that was the only way to get a PhD in pre and perinatal psychology. So I created my program, inspired by hers, and she supported me in it. And I did, uh, I was already studying with William, but I did, actually studied very intensively with him for six years and um, managed to get a certificate out of him to prove that I'd done level one of his training. He very rarely gives us out. <laughs> um, but I needed it because it was part of my PhD. And I couldn't get my PhD unless he gave me that piece of paper. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, I had quite an unusual uh, doctoral program, which I created and brought in things that felt important to me, including embryology. Well, and before we get to embryology, there's two other schools that you've studied and you also teach within Continuum and uh, Craniosacral Biodynamics. Could you just briefly touch on those two schools of thought, how you've integrated, how you how you learn them and integrate them into your broader practice. Mm, yeah. Um, <clears throat> <sighs> realizing I've done a lot of things. Um, <laughs> yes, you yeah. have. So, yeah, maybe I'll start with Continuum. And to say I was actually introduced to Continuum through um, my dance movement therapy program. Mm -hmm. I resisted it for years, and I won't go into why. <laughs> But um, eventually, uh, I, I, I ended up moving to Santa Barbara because I was invited to teach at the Santa Barbara Graduate Institute, which, which was an, at the time a new institute, um, which had programs, uh, uh, PhD programs in pre and perinatal psychology and somatic psychology, you know, my two areas. Yeah, so exactly. I, I, yeah, so I was I gave up my wonderful life in Boulder and I moved there, started a new life, um, where, by the way, I got to work very intensively with Ray Castellino, who is another pioneer in, in the field of pre and perinatal psychology. And while I was there, I started to think about Continuum and Emily Conrad. And I started to have this feeling like, I had to go and meet Emily or I was going to die. Wow. 
I mean, it was really strong. So I ended up when I moved to <laughs> when I moved to Santa Barbara, I promised myself I would never drive to LA. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and only Emily could have gotten me driving to LA. It's a, a little less than a two hour drive, depending on traffic. Um, so I ended up going to one of her classes and, uh, and then having a meeting with her. I had this feeling she was my mentor and I hadn't been looking for a mentor, but I just felt that. And uh, <laughs> dear Emily, I, I remember telling her, oh, I feel like I've come home and in her New York way. She said, of course. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I feel like uh, Continuum probably did save my life. Uh, she actually helped me uh, get a malignant melanoma diagnosed. I don't think I would have wow. bothered otherwise. So, you know, literally, I think she might have saved my life. But... Yeah, Continuum was a has been a profound influence for me, and I I was very fortunate to be able to then move to Santa Monica and study intensively uh, with Emily. For those who are not familiar with Continuum, can you do like a little, little short introduction to what it is? And because I'll give this in context to our later discussion on premium neuropsychology and your overall approach. Yeah, and and also because Continuum and Emily really influenced my book Spirit into Form. Um, so Emily, uh, that one, <laughs> yeah, thanks. Emily was considered a, a somatic visionary and, um, she developed continuum, which is, um, which she used to you call it an inquiry into our fluid nature. And it's using different kinds of breaths and sounding that we usually direct into the tissues of our bodies and movement, um, which is often very subtle, you know, it can be like tiny little micro movements, um, which someone might not even be able to see, but you can feel it. And, and really deep listening, I consider it a mindfulness practice. Yeah. Um, so uh, something that I found with Continuum is that, you know, I, we'll talk about this, I guess, later, but I had been teaching embryology through movement through the body for some years of that when I came to Continuum. And I found that Continuum just naturally takes us to that place. where um, We drop into this very fluidic embryo, embryological type state. So um, yeah, it's been a very profound influence for me. And I could talk for hours about it, but I'll also talk about craniosacral <laughs> dynamics. <laughs> um, so, uh, yeah, that was my first book, The Breath of Life and Introduction to Craniosacral Biodynamics. So, I was introduced to craniosacral therapy when I was uh, studying body work, different kinds of body work, back in Nelson, British Columbia. Um, and it was one of those things where it, I actually took a six month intensive body work training. And the last week we were introduced to craniosacral and I was like, oh, that's it. <laughs> um, so I went on to, to study what I could. When I got to Boulder, um, I kept hearing about this other kind of craniosacral therapy that I hadn't encountered yet. And at that point, my now husband, Franklin Sills was, um, uh, he, he had gone to America a few times and uh, had a few trainings there. And John and Anna Chitty, who live in, in Boulder, uh, well, John sadly passed away not long ago, but um, they were living in Boulder. And um, I, uh, Anna and I were actually friends. Um, and I was planning to take this training when I finished my PhD, because <laughs> I kept hearing such wonderful things about it. And several of my friends were taking it and they practice on me. And um, so, so I, I ended up taking the, their training and um, which was really Franklin's training that they had, had learned. And then Franklin ended up coming to Boulder and teaching some post-grads. And um, so I, I got to meet Franklin and then 
that's not when we got together. We got together when we were <laughs> both presenting at a conference, but, oh, nice, um, nice. but yeah. Um, but craniosacral uh, biodynamics is a form of craniosacral therapy that's really working with deeper formative forces. And that includes uh, the forces that guide our formation in the womb, as well as throughout life. And it also includes the concept of there being some vast uh, intelligence, the breath of life, something that is, is guiding us, and the concept of an original blueprint. So like when you have a house and it's being designed, there's a blueprint according to which it's supposed to be built. And so the original blueprint is a similar idea for us. You know, there's uh, a design according to which we are, or perhaps originally designed to, to, to be formed like, um, but various conditions in life also have their influences. So that concept of the original blueprint uh, also inspired me when I was, as, as I began teaching embryology, to not just look at, first of all, not just look at the structures, but look at the energetic formation of them. And also in terms of pre and perinatal psychology, to not just look at the trauma, but also what I call our original embryological potential. That, you know, most people in the field, in the trauma fields, are there because of their own trauma, I think, um, or maybe trauma in their families. And, um, you know, they're focused on the trauma. <laughs> and modern trauma work, in modern trauma work, we've learned that focusing on the trauma isn't always as helpful as being able to, to touch in on it from a more resourced, settled place. And I really learned a lot about that state in biodynamics and also in continuum. And a continuum also is about that potential. So we, we in continuum, similar to biodynamics, as we do what we do, <laughs> we, we begin to melt and become more fluid and come back to our original fluidic nature where our patterns of holding can begin to melt and then we can reform ourselves. Well, let if, me ask you about that, if you don't mind, because <clears throat> um, you know, one of the critiques I've heard from of somatic psychology from some people is the more the older way of doing where you break the armor and then release the person. And some of the concerns are what kind of what you just acknowledge is like, they don't have the resources and in, inner resources to deal with the loss of their armor, you know, so they just kind of recollapse or, you know, create a new series of armors to protect themselves. Um, so I'm curious, you know, using um, craniosacral biodynamics and continuum, how, and then your other work that you do, how might you think about helping someone generate the resources necessary? So as you deconstruct the, the tightness, the constrictions, the contraction, and allow for more fluidity, that it happens in such a way that it's a healthy expression as opposed to call, requiring them to kind of fall, fall back and, and recreate the uh, protection, um, the defense mechanisms, if you want to use that. Yeah. I don't yeah. know if that was clear, but. Well, it's clear to me. Okay, good. <laughs> I hope good. it's clear to others too. Okay, but, good. Yeah, I think that's so important. And having spent years, you know, when I was studying somatic psychology, it was very cathartic and everything you're describing. Yeah. And, you know, I learned a lot. Um, about my history, um, but it was really difficult, you know. Um, I, I now look back and think, God, I, I probably spent most of those three years of my master's program in shock, <laughs> you know, and then I was supposed to go and do clinical function and write a master's thesis and, you know, all the academic work as well. And, I, you know, I see that kind of work as um, making it very easy for people to get lost in their trauma. And rather than, yeah, as you say, being in a resourced state. So 
um, my experience with biodynamics really helped me with that because we start the way, um, what I learned from Franklin, the way we teach it, um, the institute that, that he and his ex-wife started, Karuna Institute, um, we begin every session with settling. What helps you to settle? What, what speaks to you of okayness, of wellness? And I'd invite people listening to also consider that, especially because, you know, I think we'll, as we talk about this kind of material, the pre and perinatal material, people can easily be drawn into that and forget that we're actually, whatever age we already are now, you know, we've all gotten through that. We're grown ups. I imagine people listening to this are probably adults um, and certainly have a lot of skills that, you know, we didn't have when we were in the womb or just being born. You know, we have a lot of abilities. And one of them is to be able to make choices, um, to direct our awareness. So for example, you know, can we feel what we're sitting on? Let's feel our seat. And Michael, I notice you take a breath as you feel your seat. You know, <laughs> yep. the breath is helpful. <laughs> yeah, feeling our feet. Yeah. Yeah, it, it's, it's really interesting because as simple as that sounds, most people don't do it. Mm -hmm. And the ones who end up practicing it as a, you know, as, a, as a practice, they see how profound it can be just to feel into your own body, feel that your feet on the ground, take a deep breath, ground yourself. I mean, it's just amazing how simple but profound these kind of experiences and exercises really can be for people. Yeah, it's so helpful. And just to acknowledge some people can't feel their body. Mm -hmm. um, and I, you know, they've learned to eventually or gradually but you know, it can also be helpful to actually, and I invite you and other people listening, you know, to actually look around the space that you're in and see what you see. You know, what colors do you see? Um, what shapes do you see? If there's a window, you look out the window, what do you see there? And can you feel your head turning? And you know, that that can actually let us know that we're actually in a safe, familiar place right now, right? Um, and, you know, we can also do things like touch our bodies, like, so I'm putting my hands on my shoulders, and squeezing a little bit, you know, it can help me to, to feel like I'm here. So it can be the, useful. Is the la cross, the cross lateral, is that really an important part of it too? No, it's just the way I can reach myself. <laughs> Okay. All right. <laughs> yeah, it wasn't a technical yeah. thing. It was just, you know, okay. feel something. You can press against your thighs, you know, or push your feet into the floor. Or I have a wall next to me, you know, I can push my hand into the wall. Um, so it helps. If it's hard to feel your body, you might be able to feel your muscles, you know, to feel your strength. And that can be really helpful to differentiate. So when we were little, we didn't have much in the way of muscles. We might not have had anything to push against. Um, and one of the things about, so I'm shifting into pre and perinatal psychology here. Um, you know, one of the important things about uh, little ones, whether we're working with babies or with ourselves as little ones, or maybe, um, you know, practitioners have clients who slip into a little one state, um, little ones aren't able to differentiate between what's happening right now and what happened back then. Okay, so um, I work with babies uh, often and uh, as soon as a, a baby realizes that I'm somebody who could get this stuff, you know, they, they're very sensitive, they get it. They wanna show me their birth. And so they start showing me their birth and it's very easy if there was, were challenges during the birth for them to go back into that time and they're in the challenge again, because okay? they can't differentiate. So they need someone else to say, yeah, that's how it was back then. 
And now you're here, mom's here, you know, you're safe. And you made it through. And I'm sorry it was so hard back then. It's a differentiating between now and then. We can do that for ourselves also. It takes some practice. But part of what helps is to go, okay, right now I'm whatever age I am. And I'm not, you know, two months in the womb or being born or whatever it was. That little one is still in me, but that's not who I am now. Let me ask you a question. So if you're working with an adult, I mean, there's obviously sacred medicines which can induce non-ordinary states. People can access pre and perinatal experiences. But I'm also hearing you say like just body work, not just, but body work, continuum, cranial sacral therapy, other types of body works can help people induce that state where they go back into their experiences pre from preconception to conception to pregnancy to birth. Um, what other experiences have, have you helped clients go through to access those states besides continuum and cranial sacral? What other practices have you seen useful for that? Um, well, the main thing that I do these days is work with people with Ray Castellino's um, style of work, doing small womb surround process workshops. And I also teach a training, which I call Our Journey Here, um, for practitioners to help them to, to work through enough of their own material and to understand enough that they can um, more easily recognize and support um, when this kind of material arises in their clients. So just talking about it <laughs> can bring it up. Um, and in, so in my training, you know, I show images of like aspects of embryology, for example, that can bring, bring up people's memories. Right? And we talk about you know, specific challenges and potential that can happen with each developmental milestone. In a womb surround, um, people, you know, people are usually coming with an intention to look at some aspect of pre, their pre and perinatal history. Um, and part of what we do, we do a lot to establish a field of safety. Yeah. And um, that's really important because we, so I was talking about how we can melt our, our holding patterns and reform differently. We, re, we form in relation to context. That's an embryological principle, a developmental principle. So if the context back then was traumatizing, you know, what we're aiming to do is to create a really safe, welcoming, supportive context now where also we're able to be grounded and settled and all that. So uh, we do a lot around that. And then just um, talking, uh, starting off with talking, well, stating an intention, but also talking about aspects of their history that they know about. Um, often when people talk about something that happened to them, they reconnect with it. Yeah. And my intention in the work is to not have them go back into that time, but to stay here, their current age, where they can differentiate, where they can be resourced, where they can be in connection and be safe and be present with whatever happened back then. And um, yeah, that can express in all kinds of ways, you know, maybe movement patterns, um, or maybe things people say, or it may be um, various expressions of traumatic patterns, like tending to dissociate or um, just speed up and get really hyper. Um, <laughs> you know, so help them to regulate, help them to, to recognize those things and where it may, might come from. So one of the premises of my book is that having, you know, our pre and perinatal experience in my mind is almost by definition shadow material, you know, like it's unconscious and it's being acted out because we're unconscious. So just increasing awareness um, 
of, of what can happen at that time, what we can be aware of, how it might influence us, then I find that that has profound effects. And then we can be more at choice. Um, I think that'd be a great segue, because one of the things I want to talk to you about, and let me preempt this by saying this whole conversation is not intended to make anyone feel guilty for how they dealt with their pregnancy and interpersonally with their partner during the pregnancy and anything that might have resulted from the decisions they took, because we all know that we have cultural norms that, at least from, I think, our perspective, aren't the best in terms of the health of, of our species, but that's just most people's, how most people live their lives. This is intended just to educate people that it's possible to undo some of the, I hate to say damage, but some of the challenges that that their from preconception to conception to pregnancy to birth caused for them as a pregnant woman, for them as a as a baby, if they were to, you know, in utero at the time, a spouse as well. You know, there's a lot of interpersonal dynamics there. This is intended to open them up to the possibility of healing some of that. And then also, you know, if you decide in the future to get a pregnant, there's alternatives to the medicalization of pregnancy that we have in our country today here in the United States or West in the West, I should say, because you're Canadian, not American. Um, but I'd, I'd love for you to talk about <clears throat> how is it that a, from conception to birth, that a baby can have memories when it allegedly, and I know you did a great job in your book explaining this, allegedly the brain and nervous system are not complex enough to have the memories that we have as, you know, adults, as example. But there's something that's retained in the system that are called memories. How does that actually work? Right. <laughs> <laughs> Briefly, because well, uh, I know this is probably a whole three-day class you could teach. Yeah, <clears throat> that, I mean, you've read at least that part of the book, so you know there's a lot to it. Um, but what I find simplest, or well, maybe I'll just say, you know, scientists these days are actually looking at is memory even in the nervous system, in the brain? Or, or is the nervous system more like an antenna that's picking up something, okay? Um, but if we forget about the nervous system for a moment, you know, a, a, a zygote, a, a un, the unicellular organism that is a result of the union of the sperm and the egg and that the being coming in, it doesn't have a nervous system. It's a cell, a unicellular organism. You know, how could it possibly remember anything? And, and yet people appear to have memories from conception or even before, which is even more, you know, mind blowing. But if we stick to the cellular level, we know that cells have memory. And, you know, the immune system is very big in the news these days <laughs> um, with a pandemic going on we would not have an immune system if cells didn't remember. The whole point of an immune system and you know, vaccines or whatever, however, what, however you do the immune system is for, for those defensive cells to remember what the attacker is like, to recognize it when it comes again, what, what the danger is like, you know, to recognize it and do something about it. It can only recognize it if it remembers it. So that's cellular memory, right? We can't function without it. Yeah, I, I think uh, quite a few things stand out for me in your book, and that is one. I mean, it's just going to take a. It's going to require a whole rethinking of our whole psychiatric, psychological, medical system to mm -hmm. recognize, you know, that as. Uh, so important, as you point out in your book. And also, I'd like you to touch upon the fields. And you mentioned at the very beginning of our conversation, you know, and book you talk about kind of the fields guiding the physical expression. And I'd love for you to kind of touch upon that as well as a teaser, because I definitely want people to read your <laughs> book. <laughs> yeah, both books talk about fields. Yeah, it's such an important part of biodynamics, also. Yeah, please read my books. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Michael. Um, so you could say we are field phenomena. And I was actually just listening to a talk, I think it was yesterday, or the talk happened a while ago, but um, with Lynn McTaggart, who you're familiar with her, but she wrote a, wrote a book called The Field, 
she looks at field phenomena from you know a scientific perspective and so we we could say we are bioenergetic beings you know every every cell every molecule every organ has uh, a bioelectric biomagnetic field that it generates and there's all the work of um, heart math the heart math institute you know which looks at the importance of our huge um, heart field the the biomagnetic field of the heart is i forget five to 500 or 5,000 times bigger than that of the brain you know it's way more important yeah i don't know if you remember <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't remember the percentages, but uh, I actually have all my clients. No, I have many of my clients use heart math. To, oh, great! To do the co to do the coherence practices to operate from their transpersonal organ as opposed to the egoic. So, yeah, so I'm a big fan of, uh, but I I don't recall the differences in, in frequency between the, well, head, the brain the, and the heart. The field of the heart is much bigger than that yeah. of the brain. Yeah. yeah, and the heart remembers. You know, the heart recognizes things it transmits information through the field its fields um and uh, i don't remember i'm not good at numbers i don't remember exactly how big it is but you know if you and i were together in person our heart fields would be overlapping so we'd be receiving energetically information from each other and my experience is that happens easily online as well you know, um, a lot of craniosacral therapists these days are working online because they can't work in person. Yeah. And we find it's really easy to feel things, you know, for both the practitioner and the client to sense things. Um, in fact, it's something we work with in our, I've been doing my, my womb surround workshops online for the last year or, or more, more than a year now. Um, and, you know, sometimes people need physical contact we can't quite do physical contact online i feel like my hand should be able to go through the screen and reach you but it can't quite but Soon what we enough, find <laughs> i hope so um but what it, what we find is that where there's an intention for contact and that's negotiated and respectful and accepted and wanted um we both feel it mm. now i believe there's some kind of bioenergetic field that we both emit that interacts and communicates somehow even through technology i don't know how that works but um so what i learned from biodynamics is that there are these um fields these energetic fields that are informing our informing us informing our formation every moment and we sense those in in biodynamics um so as i was saying like a blueprint you know it's like there's there's information and it's it steps down it comes down into more and more physical form mm -hmm. and so that also guides our embryological formation so <clears throat> involution is it like a is it like a, a form of involution? So you're going from um, very subtle subtle to gross over time. So you have a physical entity. Is that what I'm hearing you say? You could say that, yeah. And I think that you know I have a drawing in my book, which I, which I think has a label on it saying spiraling into form. Yeah, and yeah. It's that concept. Yeah, which isn't just the concept. I mean, like in continuum, we experience that all the time. Or often, maybe not all the time. Yeah, <laughs> and also by biodynamics, we feel it. You know, a, a client in biodynamics, um, you know, they come in with some issue, and the as things settle, the system or begins to orient more to these these biodynamic forces, the, the fields which are more universal rather than the individual conditional. Uh, forces um but the the client system will will discharge will release what's been holding so the energy at the holding and then it reorganizes itself in relation to 
these more universal fields. Nice. Nice. So, yeah. We often feel like we're holding a little embryo forming, you know, it's quite, quite beautiful. <laughs> yeah. So you, you've mentioned some of the trainings that you offer, and obviously you have your books. Um, where can people learn more about your workshops, working with you as an individual therapist, getting your books, things along those lines? Um, well, I have, book, Spirit and Reform. <laughs> uh, I have two websites. My website is birthingyourlife.org. And Franklin and I also started an online school a few years ago, which we call resourcingyourlife.org. Nice. Okay. And so most of the courses are, are there. Um, but uh, there's information about, you know, about me and my, my courses and therapies uh, on birthingyourlife.org. At this point, I'm mostly teaching and I also do a lot of supervision and mentoring. I'm, okay. um, and, and I'm doing these pre and perinatal workshops. Um, and I'm not doing a lot of individual sessions. I'm just so overbooked. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Good for you. That's good. <laughs> uh, I do have, a, I have, I do have, I have to say a wonderful course happening. I, it's, um, I'm not sure when this is going to be aired, if it'll still be happening then, but um, uh, it's uh, to guide people through the book, The Spirit and Form. It's called Spirit oh, really? and Form, being a book. And you're welcome to join, wow. Michael. <laughs> uh, when's, when's it coming out? Well, it actually, it started a few months ago. It's a 12 month course. Wow. And once a month, we come together for two hours. It's hap actually happening this Sunday. Um, this is the fourth class on Sunday. I think we started in September, if I remember right. And so the idea is to read one or two chapters each month. And then when we come together, I present something about the book and, or from the book and um, guide people through some experiential and there's time for okay. discussion. So it's like you're getting my personal guidance through the book. That is awesome. What a great way to do it as an author. Well, people are, sure okay. people are really enjoying it, and I'm really enjoying it, too. Um, so, you know, I'll, sure to, I'll just say, I'll make sure to include all this in the show notes. That's all I was going to say. No, it's yeah. great. Um, but people are welcome to join even. Yeah, I just ask people to watch the, the videos Perfect. from the previous classes before joining. So, awesome. yeah. Well, Dr. Sills, it was great to talk to you. I do definitely want to encourage people to check out both your books, Spirit and the Form. And then also the breath of life. And as I mentioned, I'll include in the show notes links to your trainings, your institute, the, your, your book uh, class, and all those kind of things like that. And I uh, really appreciate your time. I really want to encourage people to check out your work. It's, it's amazing. Cutting edge. And I hope it uh, infiltrates the culture really deeply because I, I would imagine you'd agree with me. We're in many cases heading in the wrong direction in terms of our mm -hmm. health and well-being and connections with other human beings and life in general. So I, I think mm -hmm. we have a lot of work ahead of ourselves to mm -hmm. move ourselves in a better direction. And I, and I see you as playing a major role in that. Oh, thank you, Mike. I really appreciate your work too. And I do think there's a lot of potential. Actually, I'm wondering if I could read a sentence from my book. Please, please do. Please do. Yeah. Uh, where did I put it? It's um, actually from the last page. <laughs> The last chapter is about pre and perinatal material as shadow. Um, so yeah, this is from the last page. As past wounds are healed, the possibility of perceiving and meeting ourselves and one another with heart-centered acceptance, compassion, unconditional love, appreciation, and respect becomes more habitual. We can then meet and hold each other as every prenate and newborn needs to be met. This kindles my hope for our future. Amen. <laughs> Amen. From your, so, from your lips I, to God's ears, maybe so. <laughs> I hope it, our future includes more of that. Um, and I hope my book can contribute to that. 
it, it definitely does. And once again, let me encourage people to check both of your books out, but definitely your new book, uh, Spirit into Form. And, you know, I, I think it's must reading for anyone in the medical, psychological, spiritual space. Um, all doctors should be reading it. Therapists should be reading it. Parents should be reading it. Future parents should be reading it. I mean, I love to see it more broadly taken in as just the norm of what we do, of how we understand preconception, conception, the whole birthing process, and how we how we want to relate to ourselves and one another. So, thank yes. you for your time. Oh, thank you, Michael. Good to see you. Yeah, same. Take care.